I mean, firstly, I'd just like to start off by, by thanking the organizers for having me here today and uh, to take from what our esteemed moderator said earlier, it, it is in fact I who has a rather daunting task to follow such esteemed and senior members of the bar, but hopefully I shan't disappoint. The, the subject matter that I'd like to touch upon today is more along the lines of the various practical nuances in an international arbitration scenario that's often overlooked and the reason why individuals today say, oh look, you know, arbitration in India has various inherent delays in terms of you know, prolonged dates being taken and, and the matter just being a never-ending process. Why? For instance, I'll give you, uh, I'll narrate this through a few examples and then perhaps uh, convey certain measures that one could adopt to remove these inherent delays. You know, I was acting as a counsel in an arbitration with uh, three retired uh, chief justices of our Supreme Court and I came across a scenario where one of the uh, members of the tribunal said, look, we're not accepting this affidavit of evidence and we were all quite shocked. We said, why not? It doesn't meet the requirements of the Evidence Act and then we very humbly sort of tried to uh, you know, inform the tribunal, remind the tribunal that, look, the Evidence Act and, and various other procedures do not apply strictly to an arbitration process. But they were very stuck in their mindsets, et cetera, which is to sort of re-emphasize what was said earlier by my panelists and during the inauguration session, that, that training is of fundamental importance. And the other aspect, which is often, more often than not overlooked, is when a person prepares a statement of claim, by default, what one tends to do is just put all your facts in, put all your various claims in X, Y, Z amounts without what I call completing the most important housekeeping exercise prior to that is perhaps engaging a quantification expert, an expert who will analyze or understand the various losses and various potential damages that you can actually claim. Now, this helps in multiple, in multiple uh, manners. For instance, during your stage, I mean, I'm sure everyone is aware of the various stages in an arbitration process. When you get to the stage of your affidavit of evidence, one of the biggest difficulties that a lawyer or an instructing attorney faces in that process is to, you finally then realize, oh gosh, look, we have claimed 800 crores, but we only have about evidence or documentary evidence to prove about half of that, or perhaps sometimes even less. And that leads to a very embarrassing situation. It, it sort of, you know, the arbitrator's mindset, okay, look, it, the, you know, they're perhaps less than forthcoming on what, what they're actually claiming and should claim. Whereas if before drafting your statement of claim, okay, you prepare an expert report, engage an expert who will accurately quantify your losses, you know, whether it be in a power generation project in terms of losses arising from delayed in construction costs, you know, loss in power generation, et cetera. That helps not only in, in devising a more concrete statement of claim, but even in terms of your affidavit of evidence, it reduces the, the unnecessary time that would be wasted by the other side, your opposing side, to during the cross-examination process, which as I'm sure you know, my, my panelists and many of you who have experienced arbitrations, I mean, you often find situations where, you know, cross-examination is just absurd. What did you do? Where have you studied? Where are you from? Zero relevance. In fact, I was discussing with a colleague of mine earlier, you know, in, in, in Bombay there are certain arbitrators, et cetera, who have certain predispositions saying, and in fact some of the judges in, recial, in recent judicial pronouncement have said that, look, do not question and do not you know, in the cross-examination process, when there is an admitted fact, you know, admitted documents, etc., it is perhaps not relevant to cross-examine on that because it is admitted. One shouldn't go beyond what is absolutely necessary. As, as Mr. Ratan Singh said earlier, you know, in a span of two days in an ICC arbitration, why were they able to, you know, finish so much as opposed to what we in India tend to do? You know, not to take away from you know, to, to say that, look, arbitration in India is, is, is the only place where arbitration has its various inherent difficulties. I mean, look, various institutions across the world and various jurisdictions have their own problems. Like recently in Dubai, a few months ago, the enactment of the Rule 247, where arbitrators and experts can be arrested for making statements during an arbitration process or rendering opinions which are which can offend the public sentiment. I mean, that's, that's absurd, that that's almost a draconian law in that sense. You know, so let us not think that India is, you know, perhaps not the most conducive, et cetera. I mean, look, each jurisdiction has its own uh, difficulties that one needs to get around, which is why I think institutional arbitration at, uh, like my esteemed panelists said earlier, at the grassroots level and having it in various 
jurisdictions and in various regions of India is what is really needed to push institutional and arbitration, the mechanism of arbitration in India. And you know, some of the other issues, as I was mentioning, to expedite the process in an international or in any arbitration process is taking further from what I said earlier about an expert report. Now, another, now in India, unfortunately, most individuals or most practitioners who aren't familiar with international arbitration best practices aren't aware of something called a Calder Bank offer. You know, it's based on a, a, an English Court of Appeal decision, the commercial bench of 19, I think, 74 decision, where very interesting, and, and a cold bank offer effectively is a mechanism that a lot of practitioners, experienced practitioners in an international arbitration scenario use to restrict your costs when you know that the other side perhaps might be having an upper hand after going through a certain round of cross-examinations, etc. And and I, I wouldn't want to go too much into detail, otherwise I'll have my our moderator over here sort of uh, you know banging the, the gavel, as, so as to speak. But Things like that expedite the process. And how does one get to know about this? Through training, which is why you know, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators is, like you know, Mr. Ratan Singh said earlier, one of the foremost institutes that helps you not only understand various best practices, perhaps not only from the India perspective, but globally, and adopt that mechanism. You know, going further from what you know, Mr. Basin and, and my other panelists and members earlier said, that. One should not, and I find it very disappointing at times where as Indian arbitrators or Indian lawyers, we tend to appoint in an international arbitration senior members of you know, the UK bar or the Singapore bar, et cetera. Why is that the case? Why can't we generate and develop the Indian bar? And how does one do that? I mean, for the young students out there, you know, one, a few thoughts to, uh, as food for thought perhaps, two ways in which one can start generate generating a mechanism to train the next generation. Look, you cannot expect young members of the, uh, of the bar or, or young aspiring arbitration lawyers or students to suddenly know the ins and outs of how an arbitration works. Now, in an international arbitration scenario, perhaps the first step is to have young members of the bar, perhaps in the first five to first four to five years of the profession be appointed as tribunal secretaries in an arbitration. Now, tribunal secretaries is nothing in, but in, in simple terms as a buffer between the tribunal and the parties and does a lot of the administrative work in the arbitration process where sometimes, certain, like perhaps in an award, drafting only the factual aspects of that, it gives a lot of practical experience to young members of the bar in terms of those, particularly for those who want to take that next step forward into that particular uh, sector of commercial disputes. The other mechanism being, and I hope various institutions sort of pay heed to this and, and adopt this principle like certain international arbitration institutes do, is when you, ha when you have perhaps any less complex dispute, a three-member tribunal appointed, you know, yes, let one member be a very senior individual, let the chairperson be a, an experienced individual, but let at least one member of that tribunal be a junior practitioner in the field, because how else are you going to let a young member of the bar, who are effectively the next generation of arbitration practitioners, gain that first-hand practical experience if you don't allow them that kind of exposure? I mean, that, that's, I believe, extremely important, and not only that, but what that does is, is it pushes towards these individuals being key players in development of the arbitration bar in India. I mean, I think that's so important. One of the biggest takeaways from, from what has been said earlier as well is with the amendment of the new, well, with the 2015 amendment to the Arbitration Act, it leaves a lot of room and scope for development of an arbitration bar, and that's fundamental because another reason for delays and, and a very practical aspect is you know, people don't have the time, the next dates are two and three months later, or there are last minute cancellations. Why? Because they're not focused arbitration practitioners, they have multiple aspects as well. And then the reason why it's very difficult at this particular juncture to have, you know, only arbitration practitioners in India who will focus only on arbitration, perhaps that are few and far between, is because people don't understand the importance of having an someone who only does arbitration, either acting as a counsel or, or as an arbitrator. People tend to, for whatever reason, cho choose retired justices or individuals who you know, have multiple court cases who are in court every day. Now, of course, they are very experienced. Their experience is invaluable. But perhaps once we get to a stage where 
the arbitration bar exists and where people are more accepting of that, these senior members, those particularly who focus on arbitration, can then move towards being core, you know, 95% perhaps of that time being dedicated only to arbitration matters. And that effectively also removes a lot of the inherent delays in the process because of that. And, you, you know, the, the other aspect being, you know, in, in an arbitration, and regional arbitration sort of taking further is in these institutional arbitrations that you have, you know, across India, it's also very important, like was touched upon by my panelists, to, to train not only the, the lawyers in the process, but also the arbitrators. And part of that training is, look, let us not take away entirely from, you know, members of the judiciary who have retired or who wish to serve as arbitrators. Let perhaps instead push more towards having them properly trained that, look, what you did when you were in a courtroom is different, but when you are in the arbitration process, I mean, something very simple like an arbitrator raising an objection, a, a retired judge, no, I, I need a vakalat nama file in this particular manner like you submit in court, absolutely unnecessary in an arbitration. A simple note of appearance from the relevant party on the letterhead will suffice. I mean, a formal, uh, you know, vakalat nama, et cetera, unnecessary. To remove these little intrinsic nuances that perhaps a retired judge is accustomed to, and one can do that through training because look, their experience is invaluable. One should take heed from that, but of course, the mindset also needs to be there to accept these changes and to embrace the, the next wave of thought. I think that's quite important, and I, I think that sort of sums up what I wanted to convey. I hope I haven't bored anyone with uh, you know, some of these aspects that I've covered, but I, I hope it's been uh, beneficial and useful, and thank you.